The early 20th century was a time when liberalism was in full retreat. Competing extreme ideologies like National Socialism and Communism were on the rise, seducing many intellectuals into seeing the benefits of a more comprehensive role for the state, both in the economy and society at large. World War I ruptured the optimism of liberals, and the Great Depression of 1929 made capitalism seem like an abject failure, leading to an increased need for state intervention. But when liberal ideas were in full retreat, one woman did not flinch and unrepentantly called for laissez-faire individualism against the popular notions of state intervention into the economy. Rose Walder Lane was a journalist, writer, and eventually a political activist who began her life as a communist, but became a dogged opponent of communism, fascism, and eventually the policies of the New Deal. She has rightly been dubbed one of the mothers of the libertarian movement for her tireless efforts to bring about a world in which individuals decide their own fate, not the state. Rose Wilder Lane was born December 5, 1886, in the Smet, South Dakota. She grew up in a poverty-stricken household, meaning her earliest memories were numerous hardships of crop failures, illnesses, and constant money worries. Her mother and father, Laura and Almanzo, eventually lost their farm due to years of unfortunate crop failures. They were forced to move to Minnesota to live with their relatives, then to Florida, and after a brief return to South Dakota, the family finally settled in Mansfield, Missouri, where her parents established a new farm. While no slouch intellectually, Rose found it very hard to fit in with the more refined girls of Mansfield, and she found that school drained her enthusiasm to learn more. When she was 16, she was sent to live with her aunt in Louisiana. She introduced her to the ideas of socialists like Eugene Debs, and at the time, Rose began to develop a taste for socialism. But as we will learn, this would not last, and would dramatically change as she grew older. So at 16, sick of traditional schooling, Rose decided to cram three years of high school into one, graduating at the tender age of 17 at the top of her class in 1903. Her intellectual drive and curiosity would have made her a perfect candidate for college, but her family had no way to finance her further education. Rose had no intention of returning to rural Missouri, and instead, thanks to a school friend's father, who was a station master, Rose informally studied telegraphy. She moved to Kansas City and worked for a while as a night shift Western Union telegraph clerk. When not working, she spent endless hours reading voraciously. But Rose did not stay put for long. She moved to Indiana and then to San Francisco, California. There, she met a traveling salesman by the name of Gillette Lane. Gillette has supported himself through a multitude of means, writing, editing, selling, ad space, real estate, writing brochures, and so on, kind of a mishmash of everything. While charismatic, he lacked ambition, and was quite content to wander throughout the country and earn just enough money to support himself and have a good time. Rose quickly became unhappy in her marriage to Gillette, but through him, she picked up the basics of writing, starting to take on freelance writing gigs to hone her skills. Though Gillette did not have much of an appetite for reading, Rose redoubled her efforts to read as widely as possible and educate herself as much as she could while roaming the country. The couple had a child, but tragically, the infant baby was either stillborn or died shortly after birth, leaving Rose in an even more morose state than before. Soon after, Rose underwent surgery, which left her unable to have any more children. Rose became depressed and dissatisfied, she even attempted suicide using chloroform. However, she reported that she merely woke up with a headache and a renewed sense of purpose. Rose and Gillette separated and eventually divorced on decent terms. Through a friend, Rose accepted a job offer as an editorial assistant for a place called the San Francisco Bulletin. Originally, Rose was only meant to be a temporary employee until someone more qualified could be hired. But still, Rose quickly distinguished herself from other assistants, and a talent not only in editing others' work, but in writing her own soon became apparent. With the San Francisco Bulletin, she quickly began writing serialized romance stories and biographies of famous figures such as Henry Ford, Charlie Chaplin, and Herbert Hoover. Rose longed to see Europe and wanted to work as a reporter in Europe for quite some time, but circumstances got in the way of her travels. You know, World War I. But in 1920, she finally got an opportunity to travel Europe with the Red Cross, reporting on their relief efforts across the continent. Rose, along with a cadre of fellow journalists, traveled to Paris, Germany, Austria, Poland, Romania, Italy, Greece, Egypt, Turkey, Albania, Iraq, and a whole host of other countries I can't name right now. Rose imagined Europe to be this kind of great jewel of civilization, but then she was really, really disappointed by what she observed. Bureaucratic corruption, civil wars, lawlessness, runaway inflation. It left her not with the impression of a more civilized world, but a more barbaric world. At this point in her life, Rose is a communist at heart. After listening to a speech by the socialist writer John Reed in New York, she intended to join the party, but illness stopped her from entering, though she remained a communist despite lacking membership to the party. Rose had been a supporter of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and chatted with fellow communists like the then-communist writer Max Eastman, but all this was to dramatically change when she visited the USSR, what is today known as Georgia, four years after the Bolshevik Revolution. 
A family hosted her in a small village that had always owned and worked property communally for generations. Though poor, the villagers were hired and skilled workers who were perfectly suited to the communist way of life. But one night, when having tea with one of her hosts, she was shocked when he predicted that there would be chaos and widespread suffering the more power was centralised in Moscow. Rose presumed she could educate this man who was nothing but a simple farmer as she described him. She assumed that he had the mind of a peasant and could not grasp new ideas, and it was her job to convince him. After trying to explain the benefits of a planned economy, the farmer shook his head and simply said, it will not work. In Moscow, there are only men, and man is not God. A man only has a man's head, and 100 heads together do not make one great head. No, only God can know Russia. A man born into a village that communally owned property for generations had cut to the heart of the issue. Controlling the economy of a village was one thing, but an entire nation was a wholly different beast. In retrospect, this supposedly simple farmer aptly predicted the fate of the Soviet Union. Rose would later write that she came out of the Soviet Union no longer communist. She began to realize America was a nation that had a degree of freedom that no other nation had. She wrote that, like all Americans, I took for granted the individual liberty into which I had been born. It seemed as necessary and as inevitable as the air I breathed. It seemed the natural element in which human beings lived. Like many of us, Rose forgot that most of the world does not live in freedom. When I was 18, I travelled to Cuba myself and saw socialism in the sun. Cuba is a naturally gorgeous place, and every person I met was warm and friendly. It is a great tragedy that such a wonderful place and such a good people are contorted to the wills of a one-party state that deems itself intelligent enough to command every person to their whims. Like Rose, I had taken for granted the freedoms we live under in places like Ireland and America. And while both of these nations are by no means perfect, everyday people are largely free to experiment, create, and live life on their own terms. But enough about me, back to Rose. For her, the Soviet Union was not an extension of human freedom, but the establishment of a tyranny, a new one, widely extended and deeper in base. She realized that while one says economic control, they do not mean controlling the economy. To control the economy is to tell people what to do. And Rose observed, no man can control multitudes of people without compulsion. But compulsion would be an ever expanding aspect of life because humans are not like animals. They can't just merely repeat patterns. People are diverse, and they have a natural instinct to try things in new ways, to innovate, to explore, and to create. In Rose's own words, it is the nature of men to do the same thing in different ways, to waste time and energy in altering the shapes of things, to experiment, invent, and make mistakes, apart from the past in an infinite variety of directions. But these creative efforts would be squashed in a planned economy that demanded conformity. Therefore, economic control was not only inefficient, but an attack on the fundamental nature of humans. She believed that to control the economic process of a modern nation is under necessity either to fail or to tend to become an absolute power in every province of human life. Thanks to the wisdom of a supposed country bumpkin in Georgia, Rose had an intellectual revolution that would shape the rest of her life. The moral of the story is to listen to wisdom from wherever it comes, because one random or remarkable person might provide the wisdom that changes one's entire worldview. By the time of her return to America in the late 20s, Rose had established herself as one of the highest paid female writers in America. But her economic fortune was not to last. Firstly, she was an extremely generous person, and sometimes to a fault. She gave money to friends and family in need, regardless of her own circumstance. This noble but flawed practice caught up to her eventually in the advent of the Great Depression in 1929, which demolished her investments and caused her to go into a great deal of debt. By now, Rose returned to Missouri to care for her parents. Though she was somewhat resentful of this, she was undoubtedly loyal to her mother, Laura Ingalls Wilder, who most people know for the famous series of children's books known as Little House on the Prairie. But what most people don't know is that Laura Ingalls Wilder was not the sole author of the famous series. The biographer of Rose Wilder Lame, William Holtz, has shown that Rose undertook a project which involved a massive rewriting and reworking of her mother's original manuscript. Now this in no way takes away from Laura's achievement, but instead casts a light on the contributions of her daughter Rose. Holtz points to many instances where the hand of Rose can be felt. This is especially pertinent in the 4th of July sequence in one of the books, where a young Laura observes, Americans won't obey any king on earth. When she has grown, there isn't anyone else who has a right to give me orders. Themes of independence, thrift, and self-discipline form the core of the Little House series. Thanks to Rose's skill as an editor and her connections in publishing, Little House in the Prairie has become the massive success that we all know it is today. Over the years, the series has sold over 40 million copies in the US and 20 million more worldwide in 32 languages. No mean feat. The 
So far, Rose had been writing steadily for all kinds of outlets on a wide variety of topics. Still, as the Great Depression wore on, desperate politicians attempted to alleviate people's suffering through the New Deal, first started in 1933, which expanded the American government's scope and size to an unprecedented level. This was the catalyst for Rose becoming a much more politically involved person than she ever had been previously. By 1935, the former communist Rose had become an advocate of individualism and laissez-faire economics. She explained her newfound political ideology in a piece from March 1936 entitled Credo, where she wrote that, Representative government cannot express the will of the mass of people because there is no mass of people. The people is a fiction. Like the state, you cannot get a will from the mass, even among a dozen persons who all want to go on a picnic. In actual fact, the population of a country is a multitude of diverse human beings with an infinite variety of purposes, desires, and fluctuating wills. Three years after Credo's initial publication, Leonard Reed approached Lane about her essay. At the time, Leonard Reed was known for his role as general manager of the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. But today, Libertarians will recognize his name for establishing the foundation of economic education and his authorship of the famous essay, I the Pencil. Reed was extremely impressed by what he saw at Rose and republished Credo under the new title, Give Me Liberty, to a much wider audience. By 1942, an editor named John Day Company asked Rose to write a book expanding her short essay into more of a comprehensive philosophy. What Rose produced was her masterpiece, The Discovery of Freedom, published in 1943. Many great historians fall into the trap of discussing what kings, emperors, dictators, and a general assortment of great men have supposedly achieved throughout history. But Rose didn't. She saw no virtue in these overlords. Instead, she focused her grand sweeping history on ordinary people's efforts to secure prosperity, comfort, and ease for themselves and their families. Rose poses the question of why most of humanity lived in stullifying poverty for thousands of years. But then all of a sudden, over a few hundred years, Colossal gains were made in the form of unimaginable technology coupled with unprecedented material prosperity. The answer for Rose is the title of the book, The Discovery of Freedom. Rose explains that every person has a kind of energy that powers spontaneity, creativity, and drive, and that each living person is a source of this energy. There is no other source. Individuals generate it and control it, nothing else. Therefore, governments cannot control and guide said energy because they are a force outside of an individual. Strong centralized states, she argued, are based on the premise that an outside authority of some sort controls, or ought to control, individual humans. But this idea is built on what Rose calls a pagan faith in invisible authorities, almost fantasies. Energy can only be generated by an individual, not a person outside of themselves. Therefore each person is a self-controlling, and therefore responsible for his acts. Every human being is by nature free. The only system that can hope to harness the potential of human energy is to leave them free to pursue their own goals without direction or compulsion. The state ought to secure a system of rights and essential safeguards to the people to guarantee freedom, but beyond that, the state ought to stay in its lane. Rose argued that this is a recipe for a free and prosperous society, what was created by the modern world. The expansion of prosperity and the massive growth of technology was not due to mechanical laws of nature or some form of determinism, but the realization of human freedom that had its fullest expression in the Founding Fathers' philosophy. Now, Rose by no means thought the founders went far enough. She felt that they only uncovered a mere fraction of human potential because they granted freedom to a small number of white men. But this began the process of freedom being spread to all peoples. While Rose wrote for a variety of outlets throughout this period in her life, I would like to focus particular attention on her time writing columns for the Pittsburgh Courier from 1942 to 1945. At the time, the Pittsburgh Courier was one of the most widely read black newspapers in America, pulling in hundreds of thousands of readers. Under the enthusiastic leadership of Robert Lee Van, the Courier undertook what they called the Double V Campaign, the two V's standing for the two victories, the victory against fascism overseas against the Nazis, and the victory against Jim Crow at home. The paper instantly caught Rose's eye for a sheer variety of perspectives. The Pittsburgh Courier was a beacon of diverse and often provocative thought that went against the grain of its time. Rose saw the Curry as an excellent opportunity to expound her vision of individualism to a wide readership, an opportunity that she firmly grasped with both hands. The result of these widely read columns then, but rarely read now, is one of the earliest efforts to fully integrate a philosophy of laissez-faire individualism with anti-racist attitudes. Her columns consistently stress the real and authentic individual's importance over fallacious constructs like race and class. Rose even went so far as to call on Americans to abandon the ridiculous, idiotic, and tragic fallacy of race, by which a minority of the Earth's population has deluded itself during the past century. She even went further and said that people should renounce their race and embrace individualism. 
but by no means was Rose falling into the age-old trap of being supposedly colorblind. She knew full well the state was rotten to the core, propping up racist institutions which further perpetuated racist attitudes and behavior. Rose admitted before reading the career she had unconsciously believed in the myth of the black race being inferior to the whites. She genuinely believed that lynchings and racial injustice were restricted to isolated incidents. But reading the courier had changed her mind and shown her that she had been, in her own words, an utter fool and a traitor to my country's cause, the cause of human rights. The humility she shows in admitting her wrongs is something we can still learn from today when faced with the atrocities of systemic racism and the subsequent denial of said atrocities by honest but misinformed and misguided people. Rose explained that from a young age, schools taught white people that whiteness is the eradicable mark of a superior race. Environment and training created a myth that white people willingly accepted without question. She recommended a remedy in spreading the message of racial justice and educating unwitting whites about their shortcomings. In her columns, Rose advocated for free market capitalism, but she was a very, very long way from liking the actual capitalists themselves. The so-called big boys of industry had done their fair share of damage to capitalism by profiting from political connections to secure profits through regulatory laws stifling competition. So why advocate for capitalism at all if capitalists have shown themselves time and time again to be such low characters? Rose argued, in a similar strategy to contemporary bleeding heart libertarians, that capitalism and free markets benefited the regular, everyday people, instead of the state-controlled economy the New Dealers proposed. For Rose, a free market economy was emphatically not planned by a few technocrats and not enforced by the police. It was instead the result of free choices of individuals. In response to the Great Depression, she advocated for reviving free mutual associations to alleviate poverty, which some might call today mutual aid. Similarly, in education, she argued for a decentralized system of education, in which parents could send their kids to all kinds of schools suited to different demands and incomes. In her final days of the career, she attacked zoning, which she believed stripped individuals of their legal right to live in their own homes, and instead really allowed them to occupy it. As a whole, while writing for the career, Rose did not dilute her laissez-faire beliefs. She opted for articulating her personal philosophy to its fullest while impressively integrating her developing anti-racist attitudes. Throughout her columns pervades a serious optimism about the hopes and futures of laissez-faire life, in where nearly everyone will know that all men are born equal and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Throughout World War II, Rose was a staunch opponent of wartime restrictions and New Deal policies, but two events in particular brought her into the limelight. In 1943, a proponent of the New Deal and broadcaster, Samuel Grafton, praised Social Security and called for American teachers to educate German children about democracy. Rose quickly penned a very angry letter saying that if American teachers went to Germany, teachers would say, we believe in Social Security, and then the children would ask, so why did you go over Germany? Rose argued that the first Social Security efforts were secured by the autocratic Bismarck and expanded further by Hitler. Rose stated that Americans don't want to be taxed for their own good and bossed around by bureaucrats. She was deeply suspicious of the economic elements of National Socialism that she believed were inherent in the New Deal. A post office worker read Rose's letter and brought it to the attention of the FBI office. A state trooper was dispatched to investigate Rose's activities, and when he arrived he began to question Rose, who was extremely obstinate towards him for obvious reasons. When the trooper said he didn't like her attitude, she responded, I'm an American citizen. I hire you, I pay you, and you have an insolence to question my attitude? What is this, the Gestapo? After some more back and forth to the poor, flustered trooper, Lane asked if the postcard was subversive, and the trooper replied, yeah. So Rose said, then I'm subversive as hell. Her second foray into the limelight protests against the government were her efforts to become self-sufficient, living on her three-acre farm in Connecticut. Rose opposed wartime rationing, arguing that if a person admits the government has a right to say what we can eat, she declared, there is no liberty left. So she raised her own animals, grew her own vegetables, and made her own jam. Her income was so low that she happily advertised she no longer had to pay taxes to the federal government. Following the publication of The Discoverer of Freedom and the end of the Second World War, Rose never really wrote a big book again. She wrote new columns and essays, but no comprehensive magnum opus. From this point onwards, she dedicated herself wholly to creating a libertarian movement, a phrase she was possibly the first to ever use. She greatly admired the Freedom School headed by the eccentric radio commentator and businessman Robert Lefebvre who later serves inspiration for the character of Bernardo de la Paz in Robert Heinlein's novel The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Lane took a great interest in younger people. She believed the philosophy of individualism did not yet have its play though. Rose bankrolled numerous people's education, including a young Vietnamese girl and an Albanian boy she had met while with the Red Cross. The most critical relationship Rose had with the youth was Roger McBride. 
Rose was writing for the Reader's Digest, working closely with Roger's father, Bert McBride. Through Bert, Rose met the teenage Roger, and the pair quickly became close friends, with Roger calling her grandma and spending weekends helping her run errands and discussing political philosophy, history, and economics. He even invited Rose to his prep school to give a lecture, which supposedly flabbergasted the teacher who had never met someone who taught like Rose. Roger grew up to study law and was eventually elected to the Vermont House of Representatives in 1962, becoming a libertarian gadfly, constantly proposing laws to cut taxes. Roger made history by being the first ever presidential elector in US history to cast a vote for a woman, when he voted for the Libertarian Party candidates of John Hospers for president and Tony Nathan for vice president. While for many libertarianism looked like it was a far cry away from ever being implemented, Rose had a great deal of optimism. In a letter to a fellow libertarian, she discussed how the climate of opinion was dramatically changing. Years before, few held libertarian beliefs. But with the establishment of new organizations and new writers coming to the forefront, Rose believed the future was actually quite bright. Lane stayed busy writing, traveling, and lecturing, even reporting on Vietnam in 1965 at the age of 78. She was no layabout, that's for sure. In 1968, Rose died peacefully in her sleep at the age of 81. In her day, Rosewell Delane was a famed journalist, political activist, and author. Today, her name is only really spoken about in libertarian circles, and even then, most people probably don't know a huge amount about her. But Rosewell Delane is one of the three founding mothers of libertarianism, along with Isabel Patterson and Ayn Rand. Credo, the discovery of freedom, and her columns for the Pittsburgh Courier all expound a principled, unflinching love of individualism to its fullest extent. Spontaneity, creativity, and the drive can only be harnessed according to Rose by leaving people to be free. But the lessons that we learn from Rose do not just stem from her intellectual oeuvre, but also her life. She was a self-taught and self-disciplined woman who made something great of herself even when the odds were stacked against her in poverty. I personally greatly admire her change of heart in the issue of race and her honest and open discussions about the difficulty of overcoming her own prejudiced beliefs. Rose's writings came at a time when liberal ideas were at their lowest point. But her vision for a passionate future in which great ideas were ushered in not by governments, but by free and energetic individuals, set the foundation for the libertarian movement today. Thanks, Mill, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you did, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you may listen to podcasts. Visit the website www.libertarianism.org to find more podcasts like this one. I hope to see you next time.